we will not be using the voting screens that are in front of you, so um, don't worry about which picture or person is looking at you. If you don't like it, look the other way. to just um, briefly bring up House Bill 1995. Um, I've discussed a few things with the patron, and he is in agreement with the fact that with all the uncertainty surrounding um, the ACA and changes in Washington that are arising due to the, um, the reforms, the things that we anticipate will take place, um, he has agreed to gently lay his bill on the table. So without objection, I need a motion. Okay, we have a motion to gently lay House Bill 1995 on the table. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Doug Grayson, thank you very much and thank you for all your work on this. Thank you. thank you very much. Members, thank you. Okay, House Bill 1803. Second from Lee Ware. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. House Bill 1803. This bill adds the presumption for uh, presumption of disability, death and disability for infectious diseases for our correctional officers. And the reason why I did the, uh, the amendment is it, it really dialed it down significantly from what has previously been introduced by myself and what we looked at earlier this year. Uh, originally, we started off with the full presumption, which would include uh, hypertension, heart disease, and a number of other uh, symptoms, including infectious diseases. Uh, pretty comprehensive, and this now, as you will note, only includes infectious diseases. A couple of things I want to know. We have 6,700 correctional officers uh, in the Commonwealth. They're serving in our prisons, correctional facilities. They're serving in, in tough conditions, uh, dangerous conditions. And uh, this is the only uh, one of what I count as 14 peace officers in Virginia that does not have the presumption. And even with this bill, they would only get it for infectious diseases. They would not get the full presumption. I point out some of the people who have this presumption currently. Uh, salary of volunteer firefighters, members of state police officers retirement system, members of county, city or county police department, sheriffs, deputy sheriffs, department of emergency management, hazardous materials officers, City sergeants or deputy city sergeants of the city of Richmond, Virginia Marine Police, Conservation Police, uh, Game and Wind Fisheries, Capitol Police Officers, uh, ABC Police Officers, uh, and a number of others. Uh, I, I'm not arguing, obviously, that they don't deserve that presumption. They're in harm's way. They're doing people's business. They certainly do. Uh, what I am uh, arguing is that we have an injustice to correct for our correctional officers. And this injustice, I believe, is one that uh, is hurting our retention rate and actually costing the Commonwealth more money. Uh, currently, we're losing about, uh, in the last, the, the class we hired two years ago, we've already lost 75% of those correctional officers. Uh, they're able to go to uh, other deputy sheriff positions or work in the Federal Correction Bureau, get the presumption, and make ten dollars to $20,000 more immediately. So we're actually costing ourselves quite a bit of money and recruiting uh, and, and training and, and retaining, uh, not retaining these officers, but I have to go through this cycle again and again. Uh, to uh, put this into other perspectives, the bill would, an infectious disease is covered would be hepatitis, meningococcal meningitis, tuberculosis, uh, MRSA, uh, HIV, and each one of these would also have to be documented with an incident. 
the officers are put in harm's way every day. Uh, with HIPAA protection, they don't know which prisoners have infectious diseases and which ones don't. Uh, they're also put in situations uh, where they've encountered bodily fluids. And, uh, and they're, again, often dealing with people who aren't necessarily cooperative, and sometimes physical uh, confrontations occur and blood is easily exchanged. So to not have the backs of these officers who are in harm's way, I think, is a tremendous wrong. Uh, we have uh, spoke, I've spoken with the uh, former commissioner uh, of the uh, insurance, uh, Commissioner Diamond, and uh, the, the uh, explanation I got is these claims are rare for, uh, for infectious diseases. Uh, tried to get a, uh, a good uh, physical impact statement. We haven't got one yet. Last year we had one. It was, was pretty hot. We also have a full presumption. So I'd offer, again, this is uh, far lesser uh, than we're asking for this year. And also, uh, the, uh, the, the calculations last year we found were incorrect. They should get an all-state employees, not just the 6,700 correctional officers. Uh, there is a blood test done when employees are hired. Uh, and, and that's, so there's a baseline to show that someone does not have, uh, for instance, tuberculosis at the time of hire. So uh, we, would, we would know that they had an incident that's documented and that, uh, that would be you know, brought up with this. Uh, there are a number of, of, of people I know who have correctional officers, uh, correctional facilities in the districts. Uh, I would ask that you uh, strongly consider uh, supporting this bill and think about, again, the fact that we need these correctional officers to uh, really keep people uh, and, and to control the prison population of people who our court systems have deemed are not safe to be in the general population. Uh, they're in harm's way every day. And to look at our correctional officers who were graced this capital just a couple of days ago, and I have several here today who are going to speak, uh, to look at them and say, you don't deserve the same presumption as all the other peace officers in Virginia, as firefighters and other first responders, I believe diminishes the value of their role. And it, it dishonors what they bring to us. And I ask for your heartfelt consideration uh, for this bill. I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, do you have any here, anyone here that wants to speak to the bill? Yes, I do. so that as a correctional officer you have access to the health information of inmates so that you know if you suffer an exposure bodily fluid or some kind of physical contact of a offensive nature that that person may or may not have one of these conditions or infections such that you would know that was the type of occupational exposure we're looking for? Yes, 
Well, no, you don't have uh, any pre-notification of that. Now, in my case, when I uh, had the incident that exposed me to blood, I did request that that individual be tested to see if he was had any type of infection. Uh, by the grace of God, that wasn't the case. And, uh, but, I I'm sure God. Like, so, something like HIV might take the type of unique interaction with somebody that it would lead you to ask for a test. Tuberculosis wouldn't require the same level of interaction. Um, it would still be, you could still be infected without the type of offensive interaction that would lead you to ask for a test. So I'm just trying to think through the mechanics of how you would know you've been occupationally exposed to someone with tuberculosis if you don't have access to health information and if your interaction wasn't of a nature that would lead you to ask for a test. Well, now, obviously, tuberculosis manifests itself physically, so you may know because of symptoms to go ask for, but anyways. Well, I can only tell you by example. Now, I worked at the Greensville Correctional Center. I used to be one of your supervisors in the medical infirmary there. We had an inmate there uh, that had airborne tuberculosis. Three of the officers that worked in that infirmary contracted tuberculosis. They might have to get covered under workers' compensation. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone here that wants to speak? Another in support of this?
235 to conduct a physical exam on all newly hired going forward uh, so that we all we were completely up to speed on that. The cost to conduct that new physical um, for 13, we hired 1,300 correctional officers in 2016. Again, at 335 apiece, that's coming up to $435,500. Uh, we just wanted to make the, the committee aware. Thank you. Is there anyone here else that wants to speak in support of this bill? Is there anyone in opposition to the bill? Several years ago, JLR did a study in this state on the Line of Duty Act, and uh, the Appropriations Chairman for the last couple of years has been trying to get a handle on the cost of that program. There was legislation introduced last year. There's legislation that's been introduced this year. Stakeholders met. Everybody agreed that, that we would try to get a, a, a handle on those costs as they were rising rapidly. This type of bill, the presumption bill for these types of folks, realized that tell you that, that all of these folks are entitled just like you and I when we are during and in the scope of the employment we are entitled to prove a workers compensation claim we just don't have the benefit of the presumption. These folks are also entitled to do that and they can do that right now. Uh, I will also tell you and I have, have broached this with several stakeholders Science has changed, the case law has changed drastically under these. And it's very difficult, heart, lung, cancer, infectious disease. The burden, I will tell you, on the employer, once the burden shifts with the presumption, is very difficult. And I'm, I'm prepared to talk about that on the next bill that comes up too. But what I would suggest is that this subcommittee. I think we already have a suggestion for you. Speak to Delegate Bell about. Certainly, um, this is a very serious issue. All of these are, and they they come before our committee every year. Um, those of you that have served on this and deal with all different types of disease and exposure to different things. And in talking with the chair, we haven't looked at this. This is a short session. Haven't looked at this issue in a long time. And in order to appropriately address it. Um, he has agreed to put together a committee of commerce and labor um, after session is over over the summer, a working group, to bring all the interested parties before us and really evaluate some of these areas um, of bills that we're getting. Um, so I wanted to suggest that to the committee that the chairman has agreed to do that, and I hope that you will 
um, feel satisfied that it'll get a, a full look at when we do that, and then perhaps next year you'll have some more information too to bring back a bill and address even just some of the new concerns that were just brought out in this one. Madam Chair, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, the one thing I will point out though is, again, I think there's an, an urgent need to do the right thing. By we understand that. We just want to do it right. So thank you. Um, we have a motion to gently lay this on the table with the chairman's chair. knowledge. But as you indicated that this bill has been before the committee no, quite a number of times. And, um, and I uh, represent an area that has five correction facilities. And one of them being deal here that the officers were talking about. If you would happen to go to Deerfield, it's one of the most, um, one of the facilities that has the most geriatric sick population. Um, as far as the Commonwealth is treating inmates. And if you go into that facility, um, the correction officers does such a great job with these individuals, but also they are at risk. Um, once you go into the facility, everybody is sick and being a health professional myself, know that MRSA can just be transmitted from just having a cut and you encounter that inmate or um, HIV or hepatitis and tuberculosis is just airborne that you can receive these infection diseases. So um, I understand that we need to study this, but Delegate Bayer and um, Mr. Baylor and other officers have been before this committee <coughs> an awfully long time and you can see the work that they do last night even with the great execution at Greensville County. And I think these officers deserve to be uh, compensated for workman's comp. So at this time, I'd like to make a motion to pass the bill. Report the bill. To report the bill. Second. Second to uh, lay the bill on the table. It's non debatable. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And thank you, um, Delia Bell. And I just want to say, I didn't say this bill. I said we've had a lot of presumption bills. And we're going to look at the whole presumption area. And we realize the urgency that many people feel. So. Thank you very much for bringing the bill forward. Thank you for your consideration. And as the committee's formed, uh, I'd love to pass any research I have and also invite, uh, I hope that there'll be citizen involvement from those who actually walk in the shoes in these, in these hazardous jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delgan Anderson. You have a bill that might fit into the same category we were just talking about, so. Uh, it's it precisely because it too is a discussion um, and before I comment on the uh, interim study group I would like to just hit the highlights sure, of I would like you to tell us about your bill in the context and I also have here with me uh, representatives from the Virginia professional firefighters as well as the insurance underwriter for Baco okay. um, House Bill 1722 is one that I am carrying on behalf of the Virginia professional firefighters and what it does is it simply substitutes colorectal cancer, which is a form of cancer that starts in the colon or rectum, and substitute that for rectal cancer on the list of cancers that are presumed to be an occupational hazard covered by the Virginia Workman's Compensation Act. Um, and the reasons for this are um, that I'm carrying this bill is we consider it to be largely technical. It corrects the issue some localities denying claims when the cancer starts in the rectal area and spreads to the colon and then it becomes colorectal cancer. 
it, uh, we do expect uh, that there will be a minimal number of claims added, but most localities do handle this uh, in accordance with the way it was intended. It doesn't add any new coverage, so it's not an expansion of the presumption. But the key here is that firefighters are about, according to studies, 65% more likely to develop cancer than the general population. Um, and even some of these uh, carcinogens are able to permeate the protective gear that's worn by firefighters. And it has been especially made worse by the types of materials that modern day furniture is constructed of and that produces these sort of uh, fumes. So uh, at any rate, I wanted to present that to you and as I indicated at the outset, there are representatives here who are truly subject matter experts They like to come forward. Welcome. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, Art Lipscomb with the Virginia Professional Firefighters. Um, one thing I think I'd like to touch on um, is what we're doing on the preventative side this year. Uh, we have another bill, which is a product safety bill down the hall that will um, prohibit the manufacture and sale of certain home furnishings with known carcinogens. Um, you all looked at the fire programs fund the other day. We were hoping for a better outcome. With that money, we would be able to buy uh, two sets of turnout gear so that one set could be uh, decontaminated. Um, because we know that in the hood, the gloves, and the turnout gear is where we're being exposed to most of these carcinogens. And uh, so we're, we're working on the preventative side too. One thing I know that you all have been told over the years is that once we file presumptions, it's a done deal, and that is the farthest from the case. Uh, for cancer alone, we have to be able to show that we have been exposed to a carcinogen, and then the doctor has to testify that the type of cancer that has been contracted is related to the carcinogen that you were exposed to, and that that's how you caught the cancer. So these, so the number of cases are being approved has dropped dramatically over the years. Thank you. Madam Chair, Ed Rose with the Virginia Fire Chiefs Association. I just want to say we support the bill and we're behind it 100%. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone speak in opposition to the bill? I thought it was technical. certain requirements now that aren't specified in the statute uh, and they apply both to the, to the proof by the claimant of the case and also the defending against presumption too because in a cancer presumption for example once that burden shifts we've got to show uh, that the cancer was not contracted during the scope of the employment which is a very difficult negative burden to bear and then we've got a second 
strongly that there is ample uh, evidence in the body of science that uh, we need to proceed with this, but I also respect um, the desire of the committee uh, to perhaps look into this in greater detail over the interim with the stakeholder working group, and I certainly do not object to that, and so I would defer uh, to the will of the committee. And the chairman sitting right down there, so he is hearing all of this. So, Madam Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation on behalf Thank of the Virginia Firefighters, and I uh, hope to be back if you decide to send this to an interim stakeholder study. Thank you. Do we have a motion on House Bill 1722? I need the motion. We have a motion to um, gently lay this bill on the table as well. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? One. One opposed? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And of course, with the anticipation of that. Absolutely. I thought, I thought that was said multiple times, it's just not part of the motion. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, we have one final bill House Bill 1445, Delegate Ward. Do you want to come up here or down there? Okay. is a bill that just requires an employer to disclose all applicable fee, uh, prepaid credit card or debit card to the employee and to get affirmation and writing or consent to pay those wages with, with that method. And what is happening now is so many, especially from what I'm hearing, more low wage firms are being paid with these credit cards or debit cards. And they are not aware of the charges that's associated with that card. Normally, when we get a check, it clearly says how much taxes were taken out. You could even put some money aside for saving, different things. But that's not the case with these prepaid cards. As a matter of fact, every time they ask a question about how much is in there, uh, uh, is on the card, it's going to cost them. If they even decide, I'd like to save some of this, there is an inactivity fee, and it just seems as if it's not fair. We wouldn't accept it as a matter of fact. It was only a few years ago when we had our state income tax return came in the form of one of these credit cards or debit cards, and I think there was almost a state revolution because people just would not have it, they didn't like it. And that's the same way it is with some of these workers. And we're just asking, if they're going to do that, then to let them know and make sure there is an affirmation that they are aware and of uh, what's happening and what all the fees are concerned. Just want a little bit of fairness, that's all. For transparency, I think that is the word of the day. Do you have anyone that would like to speak for the bill that's here? Come forward. Did I speak Speaking in support? support? Yes, support. Okay. Even though technically, I mean, we did bring forth this bill, but once we saw the bill, we thought it was good for workers because we have seen and aware that when workers get prepaid cards, depending on some areas of the state, it's a challenge. They may not have a checking account or that they can go to. And if you go to a store and you get like cash back or whatever, sometimes you have a limit as to the amount of money you can get back or you have to pay a fee. Uh, so we just think it's wrong that workers have to pay fees um, to get paid for the work that they've done. Um, it's kind of that simple. Thank you. Okay, do we have anyone else? Um who wants to speak in support of this bill? Anyone in opposition? Madam Chairman, I'm, I have a, I'm confused about it. Ask the question. That's why I was waiting for Joseph to ask another Okay. If you want to. No, I'm just trying to, I mean, when I, I thought there was, all this does, I read it right, says you have to have consent and you have to have notice. Are there any other section of this that I'm missing? I thought, there was, I thought that it had something about how you, couldn't do it if they didn't have a bank account or something like that. Is it just 
you know, because I remember when this bill, the Genesis bill, maybe someone coming forward can say, oh, we wait here from the bankers and other folks. And we'll, okay, we'll get to you. Okay. Go ahead. Madam Chair, Ronnie Dunn, Virginia Chamber of Commerce. And let me start off by just saying I want to apologize to your patron. We did not have a chance to come talk to you about it. Uh, we were trying to get some feedback from our members um, as to how often this um, uh, comes up. And we did actually get quite a bit of response in the last day or so. Um, a lot of it coming in this morning from people um, saying that they do use this quite often. And it comes up a lot of times when there are no other avenues for them to, to, to pay them. You can't use cash. Um, there is no bank account to do direct deposit. Um, and everybody is trying to use electronics. So um, the, the thought process here is when an employee does not have a bank account, um, using a check is also going to cost the employee money because they do not have a place to cash the check. Uh, also costing the employer uh, money as well for both the mailing or printing and also the stop payments that happen a lot of times on, um, on checks. So we ended up hearing from a few. Uh, the statute already requires that full written disclosure for the fees um, be um, written and given to uh, the employees. So um, just adding that extra pre-approval process is, is really what uh, we heard from people asking that this would really cause some uh, bog down on the payment side of things and also would, um, would add a little extra time to cost. So that was just the feedback we got. But thanks. Okay. Joe, we have a question? Yeah, and we also have the front line over here too. Yeah. yeah. What are the types of, of companies, types of employers that you heard from that are paying their folks this way? Um, we heard from two large, and I'm not, I don't know if I can share their name, but uh, two large retail chains. Um, that um, are, are in this for um, the purposes of a lot of times they don't have they just don't have a bank account to do the electronic transfer, which is uh, really the way they want to go. They're worried about this becoming a mandate that you have to start going back to the old way of literally a check, um, which for those who don't have a bank account is not the answer either, um, because they're going to get charged to be able to take that somewhere and get the cash. So. And so. So these folks who you heard from, the only thing they think is new about this is the pre-consent? Correct. Okay. And then one more question. Wait a minute. What if they pre-consent and then they still can't do it? How, is there something? Well, then, I mean, this, well, I mean, if the consent still, then the con I mean, it seems to me like if it's a big retailer, they probably have an employment handbook that everyone of their people signing. They have lots of policies that people are signing. Uh, lots of other forms they're signing. Did they say why they couldn't just include consent form at the point of hire with all the other things you're having the employee sign? They did not. They just said it would add to another long list of things they need to, to get. They're hopeful to do the bank account and the electronic transfer is, uh, is what everybody would like to offer them. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from the bankers. With Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, Matt Brewer, Virginia Bankers Association. We've seen these uh, similar bills in the past that mentioned, you know, there is existing requirements, and again, I apologize to Dahlia for not trying <laughs> that we've, we've read these bills in the past, we've set up in the past on these bills, and again, with, you know, our preference, obviously, is for banks, folks to have bank accounts and make the direct deposit, uh, but there are, you know, industry delegate abuse uh, comments in the past we've heard from those with seasonal workers uh, that uh, may employ folks that don't have bank accounts, those with uh, temporary part-time workers, seasonal, you know, recreational uh, institutions uh, that, that might use these payments, the more efficient payment systems, and again, the more costly uh, um, check process that is going uh, down in utilization. And obviously, if you do uh, you know, use checks, there are you know, fees associated with going and using those checks if you do not have a bank account. So it's just a, a, an a option uh, to use these preloaded uh, debit or credit cards. Establish a bank account so that they don't have to, uh, so that there's fees to check cashing, to cashing operations. They can do that with with a card. If you're given a card, even if you're given a notice, is there a way for you to access the money without the fees? Okay. Now we'll hear from.
part of this statute currently exists requires that if you do have a debit card, the person who has a debit card has to be able to get all of the money out at once. They have to be able to make one free withdrawal, and there's supposed to be a place where they can make that. Is it the code it's, in, it's currently in the code. It's, it's stricken in the language here, but that was, that was what we asked to have added back in 2009. That would be a requirement to meet the payment of wage that it's not going to cost you anything to get your right. So that, that, that without that, there would be a certain problem with the debit card. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any further questions from the committee? I'm not sure. I totally left. Thank you. Um, yes. Go ahead. Mr. Okay, we have a motion to report that's been seconded. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Go ahead and show a hand of the nose. So the recommendation is to report um, seven to three. Thank you, Dawn. Good work. That's the last bill on our docket, so the committee stands adjourned.